they come here, stay for a week, and a lot of guys, girl, guys and girls, come in and they think, okay, I'm going to learn, you know, how to be, but more charismatic. But then we kind of call it hiding the broccoli, where we're like, okay, here's what you think you want to learn, yeah. and we'll get there. Right. But you really probably need to learn all this other stuff too, like yeah. all this weird shit you're doing that's pissing everyone off or, so or weird habits. Yeah, my children learned that. My son had to learn that. He wasn't picking up on cues, uh, and we had a guy work with him. It cost me a fortune, but it worked. Really? Is he? Is your son? He's in his own little normal? world, right? Okay. Yeah, he's in his own little world, like I was. But he had trouble kind of picking up on verbal cues. He had trouble on, on actually not nonverbal cues. So, so he wasn't aware of how what his effect that was on other kids. Really? And also, yeah, and also he was kind of like. He liked being on his own, you know? I mean, he's, he tends to be in his own world, in his own imagination, which is good, but it's also a problem. If this is private, we can edit it out, by the way. I don't mind. It's up to you. Well, yeah. But no, I mean, it's fine. He's five, so give me a break, you know? Yeah. He's, he's learning. Well, when, it's important for parents to hear that stuff. I think when you're, you know? yeah, when you're five, I mean. Well, he's four at the time. And, and, and so, you know, all kids are going to have some issue, and, and it's a question of sometimes they outgrow it, and then other times... You know, you you have to first of all. The greatest thing I ever heard was Khalil Gibran said, "Your children come through you, not from you." So this idea that you know, I mean, I, my son is very much like me. You know, I, I recognize certain aspects of his personality where he is on the outside looking in all the time. He's well, he has a very strong imagination, so his imagination keeps him company, and that was always the case with me. So I, I know how to foster that or at least leave that alone. And then the other things are up to experts. So you have to be careful, of course, in this world because everybody's an expert. Yeah, I've noticed that as well. I mean, yeah. even and doing what we do here, going back to what you asked me, it's tough because people go, what qualifies you? And it's like, well, I can't really just say I'm not an idiot and the stuff actually works. But I also have a law degree. I don't have a degree in nonverbal communication science or psychology. Right. So... I've been applying all this stuff with, and our coaching team has been applying all this stuff, but we can't point to this piece of paper on the wall. But we get people with pieces of paper on the wall going, actually, let's try it this way. And it's complete bullshit. It's just like a theory they came up yeah. with that they think maybe should work based on a bunch of books that they read, which, which is valid in some way. Yeah. But if you test it and it doesn't work, let it go. That's right. You got to be responsive to the evidence. And you've got to, there's got to be measurable, you know, there's got to be measurable results. And so, I've always been skeptical of all the psychology, but I have to tell you, I've been to. I, I, I've when you have a uh, when you're married and you're trying to raise kids, you you have. I have a very different culture than my wife. She's like very Germanic and Swedish, and I'm very Southern Italian, and you know, grew up in chaos, and she grew yeah. up in order. When you're trying to raise two human beings, you better be on the same page. There are experts, and we've seen them that get you on the same page. I look. I spoke to this woman who uh, Betsy Braun. And she wrote a book called You're Not the Boss of Me and another book uh, I can't remember. But uh, let me tell you, man, two sessions with her. And she, I was doing everything wrong, raising my kids. My idea of raising my kids was instinct. Uh, do what I say. I'll kick your ass. I'm a guy. I'm, I'm going to raise you the way, you know, traditionally with discipline and don't talk back, blah, blah, blah. And then you get someone like her who's been doing it forever and raised three kids of her own. And she goes, let, let me just, here's a couple ideas. Oh, and by the way, here's how a kid thinks. It's exactly like when you train a dog. People who train dogs, they go, when the dog does something bad, they go, you know, uh, you know, Rex, no. Well, all right. Or the dog goes to the bathroom, then you punish the dog. That shit doesn't work. There are techniques. I watch people play tennis. I love tennis. I, I spend a lot of money on lessons from a really good playing pro. You know why? Because I want to be a good tennis player. So my grip and how I swing... All that shit matters. Where my feet are. All of it. Okay? It's the same thing with boxing. Why do I box with Wayne McCulloch, who's a, who's a world champion? Am I worthy of that? Am I ever going to be a, a great boxer? Of course not. But I like learning how to actually fight from a guy who fought who's really good. Because technique, because he can show me all the shit I'm doing wrong. Everything I think is right is wrong. Tennis is exactly the same way. So I watch guys playing tennis on the, on the court, and they're, they're playing. They're, they're, I can't watch their stroke. It's so offensive to me. I'm just like, how about, and they're mad at themselves because they can't, they're hitting it in the net. Hey, dude, take one lesson. Take, I took one lesson and the, the teacher goes, he goes, um, I'm sorry to say this, but you're doing everything wrong. That's great, though. It's the best. Or, or when, I, when I meet with this woman, Betsy Braun, she goes, um, you're doing everything wrong. 
And I go, huh? And then she gives me a couple pointers, and my communication with my kids increases sevenfold, and I'm sevenfold more effective. Now, why wouldn't you do that in your life? You don't know everything. There are people that have studied this stuff that can help you and make shit so much easier. And that's what I'm always amazed at, how people just somehow hold on. We all do it. But they hold on to their way of doing things. They don't want help. And they hold on to their sort of patterns. And yeah, of course. Yeah. And some of that's ego. I think a lot of it, yeah. pro- maybe even the majority of it, is ego. Yeah, but let go, man. Let it go. I, I'm tired. And I'm tired of that too. Yeah, the ego's not working. Look, you got to ask yourself, how is it going? Uh, you know, this is like these people who get into relationships where they ensure their own failure. They, 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 they date people that are unavailable, or they date abusive people, or whatever. What are you doing, man? Yeah. What? I don't care. I hey. I don't give a shit about your psychology anymore. I don't care. Yeah. How old are you? You're 30? And then everything in your past doesn't matter anymore. I don't care. I do not care. I want technique. What's a, what's a, let's fix this problem. You know? I, one of my favorite questions is, how's that working out for you? Because, and people yeah. get fucking angry when you say that because they're like, Best. well, this thing, you know, and with her and it's different with her because this way and that way. And it's like, well, okay, how's that working out for you? And they're like, well, you know, it's shit, but, but how dare you? And I'm yeah. like, no, I mean, you're not allowed to complain. One of my rules with my friends is you can complain all you want, all you want. But if you ask for advice and I give it to you and you don't take it and then you have the exact same problem next week, you're not allowed to complain about that particular problem anymore. Yes. Because we're not even iterating at that point. You're just making the same mistake over and over. I think people like making crazy. I think people are comfortable in that. I, I actually think that the biggest obstacle is in all people this is turning into a tony robbins seminar but yeah but the biggest obstacle is that people um don't want what they think they they don't they don't really want what they say they want and so they 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 layer a bunch of bullshit on their life so they'll, they'll take a job that gives them no time to do what they really want they'll get in a relationship that gives them no time to do what they really want uh we all do this and and the people that are that not only can confront when they're you know doing a bunch of bullshit but also Having friends around you that call you on that stuff, that's I have good friends. I have friends who'll be like, hey, bro, I don't think you're working hard enough. And I'm 50 and I have friends like that. Yeah. And they're right. And it's cold truth, too. And you, yeah. can't, and you know you can't get mad at them for saying that because they're it. the most valuable friends that you have. I'm comfortable in all of it. Yeah. I, I'm not good at anything, okay? I mean, I'm, I'm good at stand-up. But, I mean, even that. Like, like it, you're always, it, it's always an adjustment. It's always, oh, let's readjust my approach. Or, or, okay, so I'm. guess what? I'm, you come see me for one hour, and I promise you, I promise you, I'll make you laugh as hard as you've ever laughed in your life. That's a fact. I don't even know you, and I'll tell you that. If you have any doubts? Come, please. That's how long I've been doing stand-up. I have a bag of tricks, right? It's like being a magician, okay? But it, it, let me tell you, as soon as I shoot my special, I got to reinvent myself. I got to do it all over again. And every time I start, I'm not sure I can, I, I'm like, I don't know, if maybe, I, maybe I've blown my load. Maybe right. I'm no longer funny. Like I can't do any oh my more God. of this. Yeah, for the first, like, three months, it's rough. But that's what's beautiful about it. So everything is that way. You know, everything, I don't care what it is. What is it about that that makes you want to go back to the drawing board? Because it, it seems like... Discovery, you, discovery. Because you had to do that your whole life, right? You grew up all over the world, yeah. right? So you probably had to make new friends all the time, mm-hmm. figure out how to go into a new culture all the time. Did you have to learn, did you learn the languages in the place yeah. where you were? I mean, you know, I, a little bit of Arabic. I spoke French pretty well. But I went to international schools, which meant that the language was English. But, you know, you always had friends from everywhere. Sure. But yes, the answer is I became a comic. I think if I look back on it, my life was pretty chaotic. I had great parents, but it was a very chaotic upbringing, you know, if you compare it to most people, because I was moved every year, you know, every year and a year? half, practically. I remember when I was 31, I put, 32, I bought a house and I put um, things on the wall. And it dawned on me that I'd never put anything on a wall. Because there was no point. There's no point. There's no, there wasn't enough stability to even yes. bother, like, why decorate this? It's literally going to be, I don't, I don't want to pack this in, in yeah. eight months. That's right. So you would be, so my father would come home and say, you know, I was born in the Philippines, and then I lived in uh, Bombay, and then Cal- which is now Mumbai, and then Calcutta, and then um, uh, my sister was born in Bombay, and then, and then uh, we moved to Lebanon, and then we moved to Pakistan, and then we moved back to Lebanon. And the war broke out, so yeah. we got evacuated to Greece, and then we lived in Saudi Arabia. So when you have a dog or you have, you're starting to make friends after a year, and your dad comes home and says, guess where we're going? 
we can either go to the Ivory Coast or Saudi Arabia. Uh, You're like, but I, I'm, but I got my dog and I got my friends and well, you know. Yeah. So that, sorry, bro. Yeah, and 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 thank God, by the way. And the reason I say that is because. I had to learn very quickly. I love people, so I wanted people to like me. So there are two ways you get dudes to accept you. you you're you a jackass, and you make them laugh, and you better not be the last guy picked on the team. you got to be kind of an athlete a little bit, and thank God I was sort of athletic. Uh, you know, and, and, and uh, that's how you, that's how, and so I learned how to adapt very quickly. So when I finally went to boarding school in Massachusetts, because my family was still in Saudi Arabia, it was nothing for me. It was like, uh, oh, new new setting, new nothing. You, then you have to learn how to kind of like plant roots. Yeah, that's, uh, how, how do you even learn that process? Because for most of us, it comes naturally, right? I, I was born in one place. I stayed there for 17 years. Roots happen. Mm. And then I moved to Germany as an exchange student, and I was like, this sucks. This place is defective. And then after four months, I was like, oh, wait, I can do this. Mm -hmm. But it's a hard-ass process. And most of the people who were exchange students with me, they didn't make it the whole year. Yeah, they left tough. early. Yeah, it's very tough for people. For me, it was the norm. So, um, and then you start to embrace that sort of trauma or that fucking trauma is such a dramatic word. Yeah, but you yeah. embrace the like chaos that. and you start to like the idea that something new is around the corner. There's a there's discovery. You know, um, Hunter Motz, who I do mixed martial art, mixed mental arts with, said, that he was talking about Alvin Toffler, I think, who wrote a book, he was a futurist, who said, the people in this economy, in the 21st century economy, are those that, that are going to learn, unlearn, and relearn. And that's what it's going to take. And I don't think it's ever been that different. I do think that we are now living in chaos to an extent. I think that we are, you know, there, there, there's so many different voices and so many different forces pulling us in all different directions. So I think that uh, you better be able to adapt. You better be a river and not a pond. I agree. I, I think it's probably just as it's always been, like you said, but the speed is just amped up. It's been turned up to 11 from, like, 3 in yeah. the 80s. And that's okay. You know, if you talk to bodybuilders and you say, I want to build muscle, the first thing they say is you got to confuse your central nervous system. In other words, you can't do If you do the same workout every day, your body's going to get used to it and you're not going to grow. So bodybuilders always know that every time they go in the gym, they're doing something different to confuse their So their, their, their ner central nervous system is always playing catch-up. In other words, they're not giving their muscles time to be efficient at the exercise because your muscles will learn how to be really efficient and you actually won't put on a lot of muscle. So what they do is they constantly confuse their muscles so that they keep tearing them down. The body has to keep building them back up. It's kind of an interesting metaphor for yeah. building armor you know, or, or kind of getting better at something. Yeah, if it if it translates, which it seems like it should, but it's it's always it's always easy to assume like, well, hmm, the bodybuilding thing works this way, so maybe the social skills work that way too. And it's like, well, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, listen, some things are not linear. Yeah. Right. I mean, some things aren't. Uh, those are the hardest things when you have to be somewhat lateral. You have to, feel, you know, like um, you can get very, you can be very disciplined in life, and you can win. You can be very efficient, right? Um, you can be very efficient and you can be very uh, goal oriented and you can s use that line and cross off all your goals. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll also be interesting. I think to be interesting, you have to be a little self-destructive. You have to be a little vulnerable all the time. Sure. You have to be uh, you have to take the checkers board or the chess board and throw it in the air. Sometimes you just got to say, fuck it. And that's a, that's a and very, do something reckless. It's sort of a comedian outlook on things. Right. I, I mean, feel like a, yeah. a lot of. Comedians say similar things, and it seems like when sort of the environment that you came out of earlier, growing up in the Philippines, Saudi Arabia, and what was Lebanon, mm. among other places, usually comedy, from what I'm, and this is by no means an exhaustive survey, comes out of like, well, I came out of this simple life, and now I'm doing comedy in the big city, but you kind of came from an even more complex environment, and now you're, mm. you're coming from the opposite direction. I would imagine you probably got a lot of flack coming from banker family, moving around internationally, and you're like, I want to be a comedian. And they're like, wait, where did we go wrong? Or like, don't do that. Go to an Ivy League yeah, school. Yeah, I knew that too, though. I knew my poor father and my mother, very smart people, by the way. But but um, I knew that it was going to be very hard for my father because he grew up poor. And he grew up, um, and, and I reminded him, I was a dreamer, right? I, he just didn't understand me, and he shouldn't have. It was not his fault. I was just... I'm, you know, I have an imagination and I was, uh, I was just a weird kid, man. I mean, I sure. grew up so differently than this Wisconsin, this guy from Milwaukee who grew up sort of with blue collar roots. And here I was living overseas and my father was a banker and I, I never wanted for anything. And, and I was a happy go lucky jackass. 
right? I mean, that was my defense mechanism to be a complete idiot. So uh, not a very good student or any of that stuff. So for him, he thought I was going to be a failure. And it wasn't. I mean, he was worried that he was going to have to support me the rest of his life because I wanted to be an actor. Of course I wanted to be an actor. I wanted all the attention. You know, and and I don't blame him. He was just it was for a long time it was very difficult for him until I got mad TV. Yeah. But but again, I, I I listened to that little voice. I knew that if I didn't and if I wasn't and I remember I said to him, we were in South Bend, Indiana, to we went and saw a Notre Dame game. He flew me out there. He had a little a Cessna, a little, you know, uh plane. And we flew out there together and I said, Hey man, if I keep trying to be like you a banker or whatever. I'm gonna. I don't. I'm gonna fail at life. I don't like myself because I'm doing that now. I was working at Lehman Brothers. I said I don't like myself. I'm starting to not like myself because I'm not being honest. Yeah. I have to be an actor, and he, I could see his face, the horror. But you know, he's such a wise guy, and he said, "Well, you got my money. I'll pay your rent," and I never forgot that. You know, because he figured this kid's probably gonna fail, but. I'm not going to have him make ends meet. I had to do that. I'm going to pay his rent in New York City so you can focus on theater school. And that's what I did. I never had to worry about having a job. I, I, I had the luxury of being able to call my dad when I needed money all the way into my 20s. And, and, uh, but I could go to theater school and I could, I could spend time using my imagination. My father recently said, you would have been successful regardless because yeah. I'm so driven. Yeah. I don't know if that's true. My personality was always a goal-oriented personality. Like I was always going to, I always accomplished something, right? As a wrestler or was that whatever it was, I always, I, I, I always would find my way. I always wanted to be the guy people were talking about, but I don't know if that's true. I, I, it certainly made it much easier. I was going to say that he must have seen something in you. Like, you, look, you're not lazy. You might have been a crappy student or yeah, mediocre never student, but you weren't lazy. No. So he just found, he just saw. I was like, really I mean, no. I was I was I mean, by the time I said that to him, I had already been a pretty good high school wrestler. You know, I mean, I don't want to go into that. I mean, I got too many friends who are real wrestlers and real badasses. But yeah. uh, but as a kid, I was good. I was I was uh, I'd been really good at judo. I'd won tournaments and I'd won a lot of stuff in as a wrestler. And I, that's wrestling's a hard sport. So he knew that I was sucking weight and and I did really well by my senior yeah. year. So he saw that. You know, he saw my record and he saw and then and then I got my black belt in uh, taekwondo. It's a, a lot of people have their black belt. It's not a big deal. But I worked hard for it. I mean, he could see that I. It's you know just what I'm saying? Sticking with it for that long. Yeah, he could see that I had. Yeah. I would finish everything i finished college i i i never i wasn't a guy who didn't finish things so i think that he at least saw a track record of this guy who's maybe a, an idiot but at least was able to finish things uh, you know and also i mean, look i came from a wall street background as well i used to be an attorney working layman brothers is one of my clients so your dad working for a bank like that he knows it's not this isn't something where you go man i'm just so glad i'm working at this investment bank making big changes to the world yeah, like yeah. it's it he's doing it because he grew up poor i yeah. imagine and went this is a lot of money, and I can have a great life for my yes. family. He, he knew you don't have to do the same thing. In fact, it's kind of the next step in the evolution that you don't have to rely so hard on making ends meet that you're working at a job, which maybe he didn't love every day. Oh, man. Yeah, I mean, listen, the, 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 there was a, probably a time when he resented my upbringing because the guy was the greatest father in the world, but I never, I didn't, I didn't know how to sh compare him to yeah, other dads. Yeah, you don't dads. have a basis for comparison yeah. at all. So he didn't feel appreciated. I don't blame him. I, again, I, I, I swear to God, man, they, look, I, I, I hear myself talking about wrestling and taekwondo sometimes i annoy myself like <laughs> like if i if i could go back if i could go back and talk to myself when i was 21 and i'm 50 now i'd probably smile i'd slap i'd slap that guy a couple times in the face just for the fuck of it because i'm I say, hey you're nothing stop being cocky because you're nothing and you know it and then i'd say uh, learn what not to think about try to focus on one thing at a time what does that mean learn what not to think about i think that's probably there's probably some serious value in there i never heard that before so you grow up thinking that there's um a great deal of deficit in your personality or in your um repertoire or in your um your persona in general and so what you do is you say well i gotta do this i gotta do that I gotta do this. um but in fact, and I think that there is a great deal of value in realizing that you know nothing and that everything takes work and, and the universe works that way. Everything takes technique and skill and, and daily attendance. Okay. So if you want to be good at anything, whether it's jujitsu or the piano, you better practice every day under good tutelage. Okay. And, and certain teachers can really help you make leaps and bounds versus others, but you're always going to go through plateaus. You're always going to go through, um, regressions and then you'll have, uh, 
times when you make incredible progress, okay? So understand that every day, sometimes nothing happens, sometimes you regress, but that's what happened that day. And, and any time you're trying to accomplish something, it's one continuous mistake. It's always going to be one continuous mistake. And keep readjusting your approach until you get a little closer. So nothing, I don't believe in any, I don't believe in any quick fixes. I don't believe in any, um, any transformations overnight. I don't believe in any transformations after a year. I think that you can make real progress, but just please understand that everything's a verb. Your relationship, your body, your uh, accomplishments, it's all a verb. Nothing's a noun. There's no getting there, right? So within that, having said all of that, there is, it goes back to what we were talking about before. You are going to be distracted and you're going to think that you've got to do all these things first before you do that or whatever it might be. I believe that mental toughness comes from learning what not to indulge in. So I'm having a bad day. Um, you know, uh, my feelings got hurt over here. You can choose, you can choose to think about that and indulge that. Or, or you can choose to not think about that and just take that energy, all it is is energy, and refocus it on whatever you want to accomplish. So I, I, I've been doing the Goldbergs for three years. It's been awesome. And I, they gave me a spinoff, which was my own TV show with Tim Meadows and Neil Long and Anna Gasteyer and... Olivia Octavia Spencer was doing the voiceover. I mean, we had an all-star cast and these two great kids, and it was an incredible pilot with Adam Goldberg and Mark Furyk, who wrote on The Family Guy. I mean, it was a, an all-star group of people. That We did a pilot that tested h- higher than the Goldbergs. Okay, this is from Adam Goldberg himself. It tested higher than ABC's hit. My character at Sony tested 58. The, the, I think the average sitcom character gets 45. My character was 58. So uh, the whole thing. It was all a success. It was the biggest thing in the world. You're looking at like a, a pretty bright dude. It was a mil- it was worth a million dollars for me after taxes. Okay, it didn't go. It just didn't go. They Everything just made the- it and it didn't work. Yeah, out. and and as an actor at fifty, let me tell you something. You don't get a lot of shots like that where they they make a show around you. That might be my only shot. So I'm in Denver, and I get the call. Unfortunately, they didn't pick us up. So about. A long time ago, that would have, well, not even that long ago, that would have devastated me. Or it would have just been such a bummer because I would have thought to myself, maybe this is my, I would have asked all the wrong questions. What if this is my last shot? Right. What if this will never happen again? What if, you know, I, dude, I, I, I heard the news. I went for a walk, called a couple of people who really wanted to know and gave them the news. And then you know what I did? I went and worked out like a motherfucker. I worked out and then I sat down and I started writing. I just sat down and used that energy, and I just started writing a bunch of new jokes. And then I went and destroyed. I I was in Denver, and I had a sold-out crowd, two sold-out shows, and I fucking destroyed that room. And then I came back, and I wrote some more. I wrote more. And I'm telling you that I haven't thought about it since. I really haven't. Everybody's like, oh, my God, it must be such a bummer. No, it's not. It's the business. It's like playing football. I hurt my knee. I'm not going to indulge in my knee. It, it, It doesn't matter. You just keep moving forward. So I learned what not to think about. I learned what I learned what not to indulge in. How long did that take you? It. it I'm fifty. Yeah. Forever. Which I thought was. But a type but it of... doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did. I did. I looked at your IMDb and I was like, fifty. No, that guy isn't fifty. This is all messed up. And then I looked at the amount of stuff that you've been in. Yeah. And I know how I, a little bit of how auditioning works here in Hollywood. Not not very much. Mm. But I thought. If you've been in that much stuff, that means you've auditioned for ten times this amount of stuff. Oh, dude, or I've, more. I've failed. I've failed one million times in this business over twenty three years. So I like your attitude. Thank you for talking about how tight my skin is. That's what that was. That's what yeah, I'm taking. Yeah, yeah, take it out. Yeah, like. yeah. But but um, that but that's the idea. That so 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 it took me a long time, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. Again, these are just ideas. All of us, all of us are capable of of applying these ideas when you hear somebody older like me and you're a young man and he says learn what not to think about and by the way i got that from elliot hulse who's a strength oh, yeah. and conditioning sure. coach and i heard him say this on a video and i was i don't know 40 i don't know maybe i was young uh, older 43 and i was like why didn't i ever think about that 
Why? And then I, then I extrapolated. And I was like, everything is a process of deletion. Everything is. When you write a script, what do you, the, the, the huge part is what are you not putting in? So much of thinking is that way. So much of thinking, so much of learning and getting better at something is just do what you're told. Get out of your own way. Relax. Let the racket do all the work. When you're boxing, let let just relax. Let let your arms go. You know, don't stop thinking. Stop thinking. I think Einstein said thinking is the enemy of perfection. I don't like these these platitudes because like they the don't mean anything. Bromides. I don't like I don't like bumper stickers. Yeah, because it, it help. It doesn't help you at all. We riff on that all the time. But there are ideas. There are ideas that, that there are um, perspectives and there are techniques. Another great technique that I heard Tony Robbins one time say, I was going to make fun of him. I listened to every one of his tapes because I was writing a TV show about a, a self-help guru. And I ended up becoming like, I was like, oh my God, this guy's way too smart to make fun of. And he actually yeah. had a lot to say. Uh, again, I'm very skeptical of the self-help gurus. Yeah. Just do the work, do the job. But he said something really interesting. He said, most people have a primary question in their brain. Uh, and that primary question is usually very unhelpful. It's usually like, what if I, am I lovable? You know, how am I going to get famous? What if I fail? Yeah. yeah. Well, not even that. I mean, how am I going to get famous would be a better question. But, yeah. you know, in other words, that it's might be the wrong a, priority. But, yeah. but you know, people, people are like, love. what if I, yeah, what if I can't do this? What if I suck? What if, and he said, just reprogram your, your, your brain to ask a better question. Ask an empowering question. What action do I have to take today to get closer to who I want to be? Who do I really want to be? It's a huge question. Well, what, what do I really want? The end is when you write a script, John Truby's book, The Anatomy of Story, if you ever write, that's what you should read. And he said the character is based on, you know, the, the through line is the character has a desire. The character wants something, but they give that up in a good movie for what they actually need. Sure, for what they need, yeah. Yeah, so so what you want versus what you need are two very different things. I think Often that's... some relationship or romance for Hollywood purposes, but it yeah. th does bring up a good point. Why strive so hard in the acting arena when all the articles all the research is like my heart's in stand-up i love stand-up i can make money doing stand-up i make myself feel better from rejection by going to do stand-up why even bother with all the other stuff why why not just focus only on stand-up because self-expression is too fun in many other different forms i uh, because acting has come to me and i love it and I love working with people, especially like on a show like the Goldbergs. They're all hilarious. So, and and because I can. So I love acting. I love stand-up, which is its own thing. It's a solitary experience. But acting is a collaborative experience. Oh, so I want both. Um, why not? Uh, why, why do I work hard at my tennis game? Uh, why do I spend a fortune play, uh, paying pros to hit with me? And Which will never and, return on that of investment course it monetarily. Won't. I spoke, like my, the guy said recently, he said, yeah, you could be a, you could be a level five player and play in tournaments. Could I? Awesome. That, that's, well, yeah. that's, yeah, I guess if I really applied myself, do I don't give a shit. I just love thinking I'm good. I like watching myself get better. I love hitting in a way that I th never thought was possible. And it has nothing to do with anybody watching. It's just that I'm, I'm then applying that to boxing. Like I never thought three years ago, I was like, I want to learn how to box, right? I want to learn how to fight. Like I want to get in the ring and move around and stuff. I don't. I'm not. I'm not gonna beat good guys, and 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 you know it doesn't make sense. But it's really fun to hit dudes and 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 spar. And my I'm nervous and I'm wearing a headgear and you get hit and sometimes it get hurt. It hurts. I know there's head trauma and stuff, but it's terrifying. As long as you're you're not getting beat down. Every uh, week, yeah, I'm not. You know, right. listen. Sometimes you get hit and it's gonna hurt, but I'm not fighting guys that are. You get hurt when you when you spar with guys who aren't good. Aren't good. It's yeah. the pros who are just tapping you and showing you shit that you don't get hurt. Even sometimes you might get cl clipped a little, but they're not they're not gonna beat up on you. Yeah. The, but the point I'm making is that. I like doing a lot of things. Sure, why not focus on stand-up? Maybe I'd be the greatest. I don't know. Who knows? When you focus on just one thing and you're obsessive. I'm not that kind of person. I you don't want to obsess about multiple things at once. I just like, I have a lot of different interests. You know, my podcast, all that stuff. With physical skills, it sounds like you are w with me with, like, languages and stuff like that. I love, I'll pick up a new language, any excuse that I can. And people will always go, why are you taking Chinese lessons? And I'm like, well, I, I like being able to speak Chinese and getting better at Chinese. Why do you want to learn how to read the German equivalent of the New Yorker in native German. I don't know, because I my German level has been stuck where it is since high school, and it's kind of stupid to leave. It bothers you, hang. right? It does. It bugs you. It, it sticks in your head. That's what was doing. That was what was going on with tennis and with uh, with boxing. Like it bothered me. It was like it was stuck, and I was like, I played. I was in Biarritz, and I played tennis, and I sucked. And I was watching these women, these professional satellite pros, play, and I was like, I want to play like that. 
I want to be able to hit like that. And I was embarrassed. I was in, I was fucking embarrassed that I was yeah. hitting the way I was. I was embarrassed. And it sounds so stupid, but I was like, I'm gonna learn how to hit really well. I'm I'm done. I'm gonna fuck. And I and it bothered me. So yeah. I, I I I addressed it. <laughs> you Were you know? like that as a kid though? Too was it like probably. all right? I got to keep going in this direction, yeah. or was it just no? Scattered? Probably. I probably was. I mean, if I think back on it, I was, I didn't have the opportunity. I wish I had, I, I was just moved around too much. So I didn't have any, you know, I, I always wanted to be in, into karate. I wanted to be like, you know, f- learn how to fight that, you know, then I found judo, but I, I really wanted to learn how to kick and punch. And, and then I went, then I, when I was 14, I, I re- literally went to boarding school so I could be a wrestler. Like I literally, f- I, this is so silly, but I wanted to be a big muscular guy. Of course I wasn't, and I never would be, but in my mind, I was like, I want to, I want to, I want to wrestle. Cause I saw this, I saw these, I saw this movie and this guy was a wrestler and he was all, he had these big muscles and I was like, that's yeah. fucking badass. This guy can pick dudes up and throw them on their head. And I was always skinny <laughs> and, and my father was big and I always felt like, so I was ashamed of my frailty. I was ashamed of being a skinny boy who couldn't, um, I have such an, I have, I'm a type A personality probably. Yeah. Probably. I, I would imagine. I yeah. Mean, given what's going on here, I feel like that's accurate. Yeah. And so I, I, I wanted to be, um. A guy, I watched these two kids fight and I was, they were big and strong. And I said, I wouldn't know what to do. And it bothered me that I was afraid and that I, that I didn't know how to defend myself. So the first thing I did at 14 years old, I went to boarding school and I joined the wrestling team, terrified, but I had had judo experience. I knew how to do things, but it didn't help me in wrestling. And I remember running stairs and I was this skinny, I think I wrestled at a hundred and ten pounds at 14 or even lighter. But yeah, so the the point is that. You know, you you sometimes you do things because there's a deficit. There's a deficit. You're you don't like yourself. I don't think it's I don't think it's imperative to like yourself. Everything I've done is because I don't like myself. Everything I've done is because I think I'm incomplete. Everything I everything I continue to do is because I I'm at 50. I'm, I work out and I I look in the mirror naked, hoping something's going to change. Oh, it'll change. Yeah, it'll change, <laughs> man. Yeah, that's right. That's you what know? I hear. Seriously, it's 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 ridiculous, but. Th- th- you're probably the same way. It's yeah. Like you want to learn, like, my, that's so funny that you say that your German is stuck where it was at high school. Yeah. Of course you want to get better. Why? Yeah. Who the fuck knows? Yeah. Just so you can have it, right? There's no real utility behind it, because the teachers always, I take Skype lessons and things like that, and the teacher, teachers always go, so what are you going to use this for? And I go, um, nothing. I'm probably just going to speak German sometimes, mostly to you. And they go, <laughs> so you want to learn how to do complicated kind of, like, reading on philosophy or political science that even Germans are like, ah, it's it's you know it's a hitter, it's an acquired taste. This magazine You're Der Spiegel, like Kant and Goethe, and- y- yeah, and like Der Spiegel, which is like the <laughs> kind of New Yorker or whatever, and and they're like, you you can just click translate on the top of the page, it'll translate to English. They have English editions, and I'm like, that's not what I want to do though. I want to go to Germany and fool people into thinking like, oh, this guy's an educated German, and he's like, why? And I'm like, there's no reason. I get that. No reason I get at it. all. I totally get it. And I think it's great for your brain. And I think it's, you know, um, I, I was speaking to two actresses yesterday who are having a hard time in this business. What a surprise. And this business is fucking rough on actresses. Yeah, oh, it's actually. As soon as you start getting a little older and losing your delicious, God damn it, this, this business is brutal. Yeah. And I said to both of them, I said, look, man, I don't have any advice on this business. I, I don't know how to do anything. But I do think that you should learn how to have a full life. And I think sometimes when you when you create the architecture, the scaffolding for a full life where you're in a dance class and you've got good friends and you're eating good food and you're, you're in a cooking class and you're making your life, even your little apartment, perfect. And, and, and you're, you're, you're taking care of your garden. You're tending to your garden. You know, you're, you're, you're taking care of your body and the place you live and it's sunny and it's clean and you, and, and you're, you're, t- I don't know, you're organizing salsa lessons and you're doing these things. I promise you, I promise you that your career will get better regardless. Your life will. Your life will. And maybe, you know, when I stopped trying and when I stopped looking, things started happening for me. Do you think it's because you stopped looking so hard or do you think it's because you started to focus on other things? I don't know. I I don't know. I wish I had a formula for it. I do. I think that it just maybe was um, it created an open mindset. It created a creative mindset. It just got me excited and passionate that I, I that, that I don't have enough time in the day, 
that I mean, the joy I get from again working. I think about this, like working on my stroke in tennis. It's ridiculous, but it's exactly like the German thing. Yeah, it has absolutely no bearing on the physical world. I'm never going to be able to, you know. I just love surprising myself. That that's what matters. I like surprising myself. I like um, doing things that scare me. There's something about shoring up perceived weaknesses that isn't necessarily good for making your strengths tr- stronger, but is good for you overall. Like mm-hmm. Jenny, who you met, my wife, she, we just got married last week. Wow. So she's like, we got to do a dance at the wedding because I want to do like a choreographed dance. And I that's could... my worst freaking nightmare, man. Like I would, I was very against it, but I thought I can't just say no because I'm being a bad sport. Right. I got to figure out how to do this. So I went, and the first four lessons, I probably said, I hate every minute of this every five minutes. And the teacher was like, I'm just going to f- suffer with this guy or suffer this guy's Is it, bullshit. Are you doing ballroom or salsa? It was ballroom, yeah. I did salsa. <laughs> and, I, and, and, that's, and, and I'll tell you right now, like I went through these dance classes, and I hated it, hated it, hated it, hated it. And then in class number five or six out of 13 or 12, I went, oh, I can do this, and I'm getting better at it. And my growth curve hockey sticked up to where the teacher went, I've never seen a transformation like this. You actually like dancing. You can do it. And I remember going home and thinking, this is something I literally thought in my whole life I would always avoid and never do. Wow. And wow. now I enjoy it. I'm not trying to be a competitive ballroom dancer. No, but I, but I like, get it. I get it. We're on the same page. It's awesome. Yeah, it, and isn't it funny feeling. how you try something like that and it's – like, you know, um, there's a great, um, oh, my God, if you guys ever get a chance, anybody's listening, the teaching company has, uh, I think it's Daniel Robinson, um, and he is a uh, Rhodes Scholar. Well, he's a he's a professor both at Oxford and at Georgetown. He's retired now. And he has this incredible series called um, The Greatest Ideas in Philosophy. And um, he talks about how this... There are plenty of examples of mathematicians who, you know, spend their lifetime in a room trying to come up with a great sort of an impossible equation. And in fact, sometimes when you deal in theoretical math, the, you know, even the question itself, like, does this equation exist? Even that's something that has to be proved. Sometimes the question has huh. to be proved, right? I mean, they're dealing with very heavy yeah, shit. Yeah, theoretical. And sometimes the answer is 350 pages long. Yeah. Anyway, so this guy sits in a room all day and and comes out and says, um, I've thought up this theoretical math, this equation. I think I've given, I've got the answer. It bears no relevance on the physical world, but, oh, by the way, I'm going to die now. And he dies. And so there it is. It sits in a book. And then about 100 years later, when they're trying to put a rover on Mars or whatever, or they're trying to mine for minerals at the bottom of the sea eight miles deep, that mathematical equation turns out to be directly relevant to the physical process of getting that drill eight miles down or that rover on Mars or whatever. And that's what I think is incredible. That is is incredible. That eventually this metaphysical idea that originated in someone's brain that came to him in a dream in 1873, uh, now in 2017, bears direct relevance to the physical world. Well, the the question that he had answered didn't exist yet, That's so right. he just put it in a book and then went That's to sleep right. and never woke up, That's and right. now it's... Now, now what it does is. that tell you about, you know... God or whatever you want to say. Yeah, human know. potential is is incredible. Well, it's incredible, right? So, so what does that tell you about all of it? Maybe we're just here to to maybe these these answers have always existed, and we're just here to discover them. Sure. To sort of like that's the other way. The other the other way I think about creation is like I've said this a thousand times. I repeat myself a lot, but Flannery Flannery O'Connor, who died of MS at 30, 39 in the thirties, great writer, uh, short stories, and she um, she said, "I sit at my typewriter every morning, not to write, but in case something happens." So the idea is that if you're in the process, if you're in the business of self-expression, whether you're a writer, whether you're a musician or a painter or whatever it might be, an actor, I don't know that whatever comes with all the accomplishment matters. I think what um, matters is that you keep showing up and you keep seeing what works itself through you. What is, is the story that you're writing? It already exists. Maybe it's up to you to show up every day until it keeps revealing itself to you piece by piece. I think that's a good way to look at art. I think it's a good way to look at your life. I think that you keep showing up 
and you keep taking honest actions and you keep telling yourself the truth and slowly but surely you will put yourself together the way you are supposed to be. And um, that's maybe my philosophy. I like that. I think for a lot of folks out there, especially younger people, they go, okay, that's great. And I'll probably think that way when I'm 52. Mm -hmm. But right now, where do I even begin? Like, there's a lot of people out there. So I'll quote Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson, who everybody should listen to on Joe Rogan's podcast. He did two of them. He said, start by telling the truth. And, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. He said, first of all, don't try, try to change the world and the economy. You have no business doing that. You're 18, 20, 25. You don't know shit about the fucking economy. You don't know shit about the world. But keep your room clean. How clean is your room? How clean are you? How clean, is your, how clean are you? Are you taking care of yourself? Worry about yourself, bro. Worry about your circle. You. Are you in order? Get yourself in order. He's got this thing, this self-authoring thing that's very interesting. Yeah, that's uh, we use a lot of that at AMC. Yeah. All, how, it's amazing. Get yourself in order. Get yourself together. Stop trying to change the world. Stop trying to, you know, you don't know anything. I understand that, you know, there's this idea to protest and stuff, and there are things worthy of protest. I get it. Get yourself in order, and you'll have something to say. And and I, I think that that's, that's the, the, so, so, so what do I say to young people? Learn what not to think about. And at, sit down and ask yourself, if you don't know what you want to do, ask yourself what you'd like people to say about you. And maybe maybe dream and see what, what it is. Investigate. Broaden your passion. Learn about what it is to be um, a journalist. Or learn what it is, what the reality behind being an actor is. Or what are you really after? Ask yourself those questions. It's, it's important. And if you don't even know that, man, I believe in accomplishment. I don't care. Go get your black belt in jujitsu. If you feel like a pansy, Go, go to a jiu-jitsu class and just get your black belt. Get your blue belt. Just start training. Learn how to box. If you, if you uh, learn how to play the piano, it's all the same. There's no difference between piano and jiu-jitsu. There's no difference in what happens to your brain and what happens to you as a person. I don't care if it's a soft art or a hard art. I think a lot of people, they when they shore up these little weaknesses or these perceived weaknesses, which a lot of people, they kind of they kind of nay that. They're like, oh, you know, just focus on what you want to be great at, forget everything else. I don't. I agree with you. I don't really believe in that because I think when you start taking care of those areas that are bugging you, it frees up bandwidth in the background. You know, if you think, oh, you know, I'm, a f- I'm walking around, I'm a little bit in fear, I get intimidated by people, so you do the jiu-jitsu thing or the judo thing or whatever, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Other things start to unlock in your brain yes. and in your psyche. And you meet people. Well, yeah. And you too, meet interesting, like-minded people who are motivated, and you'll make really good friends. That's the other thing. You'll create a community which is so important and so underrated. Oh, my God, having a community. I don't have any friends? Good. Go go do something you want to do. I'm telling you, go get go join that salsa class with your wife or go, uh, go join that, do, take that boxing class. I don't care what it is, man. I'm telling you, you'll meet people. You'll create a community. If you, you, oh, you, you, you want to play the drums, learn how to play the drums well enough so you can start a, a silly cover band. What a blast. Yeah, something that's not serious. Like I know not- Thea, there's a 50-year-old woman who was, they were talking about who's as good as anybody right now. She just said, I'm going to be good. She's 55 now, started at 50. And she's so good in the drums, so good, and plays like every song. It's possible. It's just, and she just started for the hell of it. Yes, at 50. 50. I always want to play the drums. So she was like, and I have time. So she practiced three hours a day. Not that hard on the drums. It just becomes addictive. Now she plays in bands, and she's so good. Do you play an instrument? I, I take drums. You take drums yeah. as well? So the answer is no. But, <laughs> the answer you know, is I, no. I, I, yeah. What does your creative process look like when you're trying to create stuff? You said at one point you sat down after a frustrating rejection, you started writing new stuff. You, obviously, you can't just rely on getting rejected harshly mm. for creativity. That would be a miserable way to do it. Do you have ways that you kind of get in, inspired by that, or does it just happen? I mean, uh, it's sometimes it's very difficult, so I, I, I don't have any uh, sacred space for work. So I think work is a mindset. So um, I learned how to start writing just right now. So so I'm looking at you, and I'm going to look over at that camera. That's that's the difference between work. Here I'm talking to you, and here's work. Like, do you understand what I mean? So all I'm doing is I'm talking to you, and now I have to think about, I have to solve a problem. Really, creativity is solving problems, right? Sure. You wanna, you, you gotta, you're trying to solve a problem. If you're writing a story, you got to, how do I get my character out of this corner? Let, for example, um, I'm just going to look over here and start thinking about the character. I'm not going to put anything on it. I'm not going to put anything on it. I'm not going to wait till the temperature in the room where I've eaten or the dishes are out of the sink. I'm just going to start daydreaming. We all daydream. 
it's the same shit. Um, you want to get better at anything, you, you, a lot of times it happens in your brain. Like I'll watch slow motion video of Roger Federer hitting <laughs> and try to mimic it. Be like, what are you doing? I'll do that for like a half hour. It's my practice. Sure. So my creative process is, um, is I just, I just start. I don't put anything on it. Are you developing the same kind of intensity right now in your kids or trying to at all? Uh, you know, you have to be very careful with yeah. that. So what I do is with my children is I, I, I never um, – so when I watch my daughter play tennis and my son – How old son, is she? She's nine. In she's the, an athlete, but she's intense. And your son, how old is he? My son's five. My, my oh, daughter's wow. intense. Okay, my daughter is very competitive with herself. And, and, <laughs> Where does that come yeah. from? Not from me. It comes really? from her mother. I'm not a competitive. I'm not competitive. Like I've never. I don't have to win. That I never gotcha. think that. That's that, maybe that hurts me. But um, it's more personal with me. But but um, she is. You know, the other day she was playing tennis and she was she was having a meltdown. She was like, ah, 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 and but she wouldn't quit. She kept hitting. She kept hitting. So I say to her, like usually I'll say, and I, I read this in a book. I'll say. I think it was in the Talent Code, which is an amazing Daniel book. Coyle. Yeah. Yes, and I'll say, um, I love watching you play. I could just watch you play all day, and I don't give her any advice. I let the teacher do that. I don't want to be an overbearing father, and I don't want to be a trophy dad, and I have to let her find her way. But what I can do is create f like an inspiring and fun atmosphere. So I go, I love watching you play. And then she had their meltdown. And I sat down next to her. I go, I got to tell you, man, I'm so impressed with you. It was maybe the best lesson I've seen. She goes, what? And I go, well, just like you were crying and having a meltdown because it's so frustrating. Tennis is so frustrating. I throw my racket, but you didn't even quit. You kept hitting, even through the tears. It was nuts. How did you do that? How did you do that? And then my son, who is a complete dreamer, and you can't get a five-year-old to pay attention. It's the end of the day. He's tired. Yeah, but, sure. But he, he got 10 in a row toward the end. It was a 10-minute, 15-minute lesson. That's all he can handle. But I was like, I can't believe you got better on the end. How did you do that at the end? Like, you were, like, playing around, and then at the end you got 10 in a row. That's unbelievable to me. And so I just kind of marvel at how great they are. And then I'll say to my wife when they're there and they can hear me, but they think I'm not, I'll be like, I got to tell you, man, Stella, her focus and her, she just doesn't quit. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen. She was having a meltdown and she still wouldn't quit. And she was getting, and she did better in her last one, even though I could never do that. The same thing with my son. So I create a mythology. Sure. Them. Great. That's, I, I, I love that idea. Yeah. I think a lot of people try to directly program their kids yeah. with, like, here's why this is important and here's why uh, you need to do this. And it, it just ends up coming out in adulthood in all these weird ass uh, ways. Even t and people wonder why teenagers are all screwed up all the time. And half of it's that childhood programming just kind of starting to rot and crack. So it goes back to what we were talking about in the yeah. beginning. There's a way to do things. And that technique doesn't work as well as. The, and I didn't know how to do what I'm talking about. I just talked to people who are experts. I don't, those aren't my ideas. I'm not smart. I don't, I don't come up with that. I don't know how to fucking do that but i i read about it and i talked to people about it and i was and it made sense and once i read the books and i i listened to people i was like that's that's how you do it there is a way to be more effective you can teach a kid how to ride a bike and swim that fast or you can take three years and i don't believe in i don't believe in any way in uh being a tyrant i don't believe in domination um i think it's all a lie and i'm a pretty dominant alpha or i'm an a type a personality uh you know i, I or at least i talk a big game but <laughs> the, but you know i do i'll talk about being is if i'm around a bunch of comedians or people who've never fought before you should hear me talk about boxing and wrestling i'm a tough guy when i'm around real fighters friends of mine who are real fighters i'm i'm i know to shut up i know the difference i know that but <clears throat> but the point is that you have to be aware of that and you have to know that you're not a tough guy no matter who you are you're, Conor McGregor is a real tough guy. He's a great MMA fighter. Around Chris Weidman or Brennan Schaub or Cain Velasquez, he is a monkey compared to those apes. You know what I'm saying? There's a pecking order in life. Yeah, sure. And 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 so so don't think you're tough. I, I hate a bully and I hate men who try to impose their will and dominate. It doesn't work. It's, it's, it's artificial. It's an artificial thing. It's, 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 uh, you're doing that in your tiny arena, but there are plenty of people that could do that to you. And, and Jordan Peterson was saying that any society, and I would extrapolate to, um, any family that is ruled by the biggest, strongest, loudest voice with a club is not stable. 
Yeah, I agree with that 100%. And I think what, whenever we've we've talked with MMA guys and th- things like that, or I'll post something and I'll, and I'll write like uh, some comment about how arrogance is not really truly confident because it's it's always slotted in this weird sort of arbitrary hierarchy, people almost always universally reply with some insert name of MMA champion here. Conor McGregor is a common retort. Well, look at Conor McGregor. That guy talks a lot of smack and he's really tough. And I'm like, I bet you, and I write this, I have no proof of this, so thank you for this. I bet you that Conor McGregor, when he's around other fighters, does not sit there talking a ton of shit. He's the best. To a bunch of he's the best. Conor McGregor is a very humble man. Conor McGregor is also a really good guy. Now, I know that from people who know him. I've only met him once. He did my podcast once, but that's not a good gauge. I know people that know him, and I've seen how he behaves in defeat and in victory. And people love that guy, and he's great to his team. He's great to people. Uh, he's a very, very good man. And um, not to mention great and courageous. I mean, he's greatness. But and I love the guy. But but yes, you're right. He's not. He may come across as cocky, but nobody works harder. I said to him, I go, "What's your what's your how, where do you get your confidence?" He goes, "I work harder than anybody else." And I said, "Everybody works hard." He goes, "They think they do. They don't." And you know whether or not that's true. That guy, I can promise you, he puts in the work. And. And again, I think I think it's because Connor's so honest with himself. Like he knows when he steps in that octagon, he's done everything he can. He's done everything he can, and he's going to do everything he can. And there's something about that. It's there's, a little scary though, because it's always you, scary. If you then fail, you of can't course. go. Well, you know, I didn't really focus. Nobody on braver this. than that guy, dude. He yeah. puts himself on the line. He talks the biggest game in front of the world, Ireland. If he loses, oh my God, you'll never he hear the fought, end. Dude, he years. fought. You have to understand. Like I, I've I've met. I've spent enough time with him and Nate Diaz. Nate's a big dude. Nate's a big man. Connor's much shorter than me. Connor's maybe 5'9", 165. How I mean, tall are you? Know, I'm almost six feet. Okay. So, so, and you I, you can see it on my Instagram where he's standing next to me, and you can see how much taller I am. I'm not a big guy by any means. And Nate is is much bigger than me frame-wise. Longer arms and everything else. Connor fights him. And me and Brendan Shaw looked at each other and covered our mouth, and we were like, he's just too small. He's not big enough for Nate. Nate's just too big. He hits too hard. He's just his his jujitsu. It's just he's just, just a bigger man, bigger frame. Connor, they are all telling him don't do it. And Connor said, I'm going to fight him again at 170. At 170. And everybody's like, oh no, not again. Don't let him do it. This is his ego. He comes in and he beats him up, knocks him down three times, I think. In a, in a war, in a war. Of course, Nate gave it back. But this guy is this guy is amazing. Do you understand what kind of guts that takes? I mean, it's incredible. And, and you know, there are guys I, I don't want to see him fight Khabib Nurmagomedov. I don't want to see him. I would never have wanted to see him fight Frankie Edgar. There are certain guys. But this dude is special. He's special. And, you know, he believes he's great. And when you fight him, those fighters know he's they, – they, they, they fall into the trance too. They're like, I, this guy's bigger than me. He's bigger. He's, he's – a bigger phenomenon. He's a bigger force. He's a life force. Destiny is on his side. You know, it's very hard to fight a guy who who really believes that he is the second coming. It's like some ISIS yes. shit here. Absolutely. They get in there, and they're like, all of a sudden, they're in their head. All of a sudden, they're rushing. All of a sudden, they're not throwing. All of a sudden, they're, they're, they're forgetting to, to circle left, or they're forgetting to circle right. And they're forgetting their whole game plan. Yeah, they're buying Eddie it. Alvarez was like, I knew I was supposed to do this, and I forgot it. Because the when the lights and everything and that guy who embraces that that role and takes the responsibility on full heartedly of being great, so much I think of being great. Like Ali would talk about that. Ali said, "I'm the greatest in the world." Well, he said, "I'm scared to death every time I get in there. I'm talking to myself." And that's that's to me. He was putting himself in a trance when Sonny Liston when he was in that weigh in with Sonny Liston. Sonny thought he was actually crazy. Sonny thought he was going to bite him. Because because Ali's pulse, he he was he kept trying to get at him and he was screaming at him. And then Sonny was like, "This dude's crazy, man! Like I'm afraid of him. I think he might bite me." You understand? So so yeah, Ali Ali edge. worked himself up into a like a Frost. trance. Yeah. But it was for him, you know, not not for anybody else. He had to do that for himself because guess what? He was terrified. I don't know, and I know some great fighters personally. I don't know a fighter. Who's not terrified when they walk in that that air and that octagon? I know a couple who might not be, but maybe they're not smart enough to be scared. Self aware enough to yeah. know they're actually scared. But I know the baddest guys on the planet, from Donald Cerrone to, they're all terrified. 
Is there anything that you, looking back, and I mean, you've, you're, you're on TV, you're doing great in pretty much every arena of your life right now, even in your relationships and with your and kids. And in bed. Right? That's, what, that's the rumor. Sorry, I that's didn't have the rumor. Have said that Is there anything that you've looked back on fr- from the last 50 years and go, shit, I wasted so much time on that? Yeah. Whether it's a thought process or a skill. Relationships, or, certain yeah. relationships with women. Well, okay, fine, yeah. Yeah, honestly. But, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, my, my regret is I just didn't work hard enough at a lot of things, maybe. But maybe that's because I was supposed to just be a comic. I work hard at that. Yeah, I, I think you know? it's it's easy to, to look at my law career and go, you know, if I'd worked a little harder, I could still be a lawyer. And it's like, that would be awful. I don't want that. That's how I feel. Like, I, like I always say, I should have wrestled in, in college. Um, but I guess, okay, so I would have wrestled in college, all right. And, dot, 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 MMA. And, 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 yeah, and I would have been, a, I could have said, I wrestled D1 in college at American University. Okay, cool, Bri. And uh, I probably would have then, and then I'd probably be sitting here saying, and I'd have cauliflower ears, and I'd say, yeah, I wrestled in college, and I had a 500 career, or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I, I said, well, I, I wish I had worked a little harder, or whatever I would have said. And then I would probably have the regret that I didn't take drumming or the piano, yeah. or Which I didn't, or I didn't comedy. act enough, yeah. or whatever the fuck it was. I I, don't, I think I'd always have, and uh, you know, and I bet you wanting to wrestle is I had the, the motivation behind that is wrong. It's just would be because I want to say I wrestled. So yeah. people thought I was a little tougher you than I am. Polish that trophy on the mantle one more. Yeah, time. I want people. I would want people to think I'm a little tougher than I am. That that, that that's that's a that's a that's a not a reason to do something. <laughs> I well, yeah, I can't. I couldn't agree more on that. I think a lot of people look at opportunity cost and they go, "Well, shoot, should I also be focusing on that?" And the, the reason I'm drawing this distinction is because you and I are talking about shoring up weakness, competing with yourself to get these new skills that aren't even that useful, and well, or could be useful but aren't ever going to be our career, for example. And I want to be really clear that you don't have to go around learning and mastering every single thing that you might be interested in or that you should think that you're interested in because you will drive yourself batshit crazy doing it. Also keep in mind that getting good at one thing is the same as getting good at anything. So the process you go through to get really good at tennis or boxing or piano or or German, I I mean, there are differences, of course, but you will glean a great deal from any endeavor that you try to get really good at. You'll have to confront deficits in your own personality, in your own belief system, and even in your what you are afraid of. You know, you'll you'll have to confront all those things to get better and to make the next step. I, I believe that, and I think that um, there's a great book by Josh Waitzkin called The Art of Learning, and he got really good at jujitsu, and he was a chess master, and he said when he was playing chess, he was practicing jujitsu, and he was practicing jujitsu, he was getting better at chess. There's a there's a mindset that that sort of can transfer. That, yeah, and, and connecting lessons yeah. from one thing to another. Accomplishment, learning how to accomplish, learning how to learn is is the point. And again, maybe also leaving with a deeper understanding, and which may be another w- way of saying you have more wisdom. I think people that have accomplished things and and come up against themselves develop wisdom. You can always tell when somebody's wise. You end up asking questions. You end up feeling more comfortable in their presence, right? Sure. Wisdom is uh, must be earned. Wisdom is not something that's given to you. And I think wisdom also is part of, you know, maybe the, the manifestation of coming to terms with your own limitations and, and, and accepting them. Being a person who's sort of, I don't know if this is the right phrase, but like addicted to accomplishment in many ways and, and always going after something and always working on something, is there any advice that you might give to somebody to let go of something that's not serving them? Because it's really easy to go, no, now I can't give up. I just heard Jordan and Brian talk about getting these skills done and working super hard. Well, so that goes back to telling the truth. Yeah. That goes back to saying, see, again, what did I just say about wrestling? I want to be a wrestler. Probably for the wrong reasons. Yeah. So I could be a little bit more accepted in the group of MMA fighters I I, I admire. A little more street cred. Oh, yeah, or, or just... Uh, are just, you know, having stories about being a wrestler and maybe I would have then gone on to get my black belt in jiu-jitsu. I think all of those things are probably, if I'm really honest with myself, for the wrong reasons. 
I think I was jujitsu is a beautiful art, and I and I actually should have gotten my black belt in jujitsu instead of my blue belt. Um, but I, by the time I came to it, I didn't care as much. I just didn't. It just, I just, uh, I was too busy. I, I I had enough trouble getting good at stand up and. And acting took a lot of my time and failing at the, I don't know. I don't know the answer. But I, but I, I think um, what I'm saying is be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself, man. First of all, do you have the skill? Do you, I, I'm never going to run punts back in the NFL. <laughs> okay? Yeah. yeah. I'm never going to be a great singer. I knew that. I did. I'm fucking, when I was an actor, I, I looked in the mirror and I realized that I was a, basically a white medium guy. There's not a whole lot of desire. Like, like this is the guy we're looking there's for. There's nothing about me that I'm sorry physically when I was young or now where people go, that's the look we're looking for. No, that's the generic guy we can put anywhere. That's why I started doing stand up. I was never going to be Christopher Walken and this great actor. You know, I've had great moments on stage and in acting class, but. I was funny, and I knew I was funny, and I'd always been funny. And then I learned how to really become professionally funny. That was the path. I, I got honest with myself. How do you get honest with yourself? Like, if you had to, if you were listening to some kid who's twenty five talk about, yeah, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna fight in the octagon, and I'm gonna do this acting thing, and you're like, man, I know you're doing this because you think it's gonna get you women, it's gonna get you respect that you never had as a kid. These are all reasons that you. You, you really need to take a good, cold, hard look at that. What advice would you give that kid? So there was a guy who I was writing with briefly, and he had a, um, I'm not kidding, We were writing. he was writing this script, and I saw a note above his like typewriter, his computer. It said, think of all the houses, cars, and bitches you're going to get when you finish this script. And I'm oh, not exaggerating. Man. Of course, nothing ever happened for him. That sure. was that was more than ten years ago. It was fifteen years ago, and I and I and I just looked at him, and I realized that he was just it wasn't even worth mentioning, and I did mention it, but I was like, this is not this can't be the motivation, brother. The motivation has got to be, and I you know listen, I used to see the shit in acting class. I would go to my friend's house. I mean, somebody in my acting class, we'd be working on our. Um, a scene for acting class and these people would have cut out like they'd have time magazine and they'd put their face on it and it'd be it'd be like a dream board oh man they'd make a dream yeah. board don't get me like started with, on with these things. with these uh affirmations sure and i don't believe in that shit no. i think it's high-tech procrastination it is and i think you're you're again oh so you are going for you want to be the guy you want to be oh you want to be famous meaning you want everybody to look at you. Uh, you know, you, you, so you want the swimming pool and the big house. I get it. I do too. We all want money. But I don't know how into acting you are. And this is why your acting isn't so good. And this is why you're derivative. Because you're not an actor. Because you're not... I was always seduced by... When I saw Robert De Niro in Raging Bull, it changed my fucking life. I couldn't sleep. When I listened to Johnny 99, the live version of Springsteen, and then I start, got into Springsteen and listened to Greetings from Asbury Park and that poetry he was writing when he was in his 20s, I've never been the same, bro. It had not the feeling, the overwhelming feeling of, I guess, a combination of joy and sadness that great art fills you with or that sort of glory, the thing that makes you cry. You're not sad, but you're crying you know, that makes you feel overwhelmingly generous, that makes you feel like you know, th th that's called inspiration. That's a religious experience, man. It's a mystical religious experience. That's what changed my life. Those were those seminal moments where I said, if I don't get close to this feeling, if I can't somehow get my fingers wet, dip my toe in this sacred pool, then I'm going to die, man. Then I'm, I'm, my life is going to be wasted. And I, I don't want to waste my life. I was terrified of regret and terrified of wasting my life. That's where the motivation should come from. Because you have to do this for the sake of its own doing. What did Schiller say? Man is never more himself than when at play. Play being that which you do for its own sake. That's what motivates me when did you have that experience because i think there's a lot of people listening right now that are going oh shit i've never had that what am i gonna do yes now? you have first of all if you think about it and if you haven't go get it 
What, what, what I mean, look, and it's not for everyone. Art is not for everyone. Not everybody's creative, and there's nothing wrong with that. Let me tell you something right now. We need good nurses. We need good teachers, and pe- being, te- being a teacher is creative. We need good nurses. We need good, there are people that do work, good cops, good police officers who know the difference. We need these people, firefighters. We need those people. Man, and don't, don't kid yourself. If you're good at building kitchens, you're worth your weight in fucking gold. If you know how to build something that's got integrity that you swear by and you do sublime work, you are worth your weight in gold. If you know how to put in flooring like nobody else, you have no idea how valuable you are. It, that is, that's when somebody is, I'm having a hell of a time with my house. And when you get a good craftsman, oh my God. Oh my God, you, you know, you're, you're doing your job. When I bring my car into the dealership and the guy is, fixes my car, but he knows what to do and he knows how to make my life easy, you're worth your weight in gold, man. You're worth your weight in gold. When you're a nurse at the, e, at the OR uh, or in the ER or you are, uh, I mean, you know, you're helping deliver babies and you're making that woman feel, I, I've seen this with my own eyes. You are so needed. You're so needed. When there's an old person and you're, you're their caretaker and, and you're there to help them and they really need you and they're lonely, if you deliver meals on wheels and that's their only meal of the day, you're more important than I am. You're more important than I am. I, I, you are. This is why I never feel better than anybody else. That's another thing. So, y- you know, you can find great fulfillment. Oh, my God, you can find great fulfillment in the example you set for your community and the example you set for your children. It's your example. I mean, the, 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 those are the people I admire, and they're as good as anybody. And they, and by the way, by the way, they have as much an understanding or more than anybody I know in New York or L.A. And I'm not saying that. I'm not just saying that. There are farmers that I've met, and they have a deeper understanding of life than anybody on Wall Street. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. That's a that's a that's an objective truth. So that's what I would say. This is really becoming this motivational seminar, but maybe I'm 50 and I'm I'm just trying to get people not to make The only reason I feel qualified to say this is I've made more mistakes than most people who are younger than me. <laughs> well, that's fine. And that's great. That's what one of the reasons one of the things we do on this show is try to get people's wisdom out of them. And to be honest, you're doing you came in ready for action, obviously. <laughs> but I'd like to think that we we came in guns blazing on getting some of this out because I think it's really easy to look at a lot of folks who are successful and think, I just have to work hard on this. Or look at a lot of folks and go, I just have to keep at it or I just have to continue or I'm never going to be that intense or I can't do this or I'm not born with the raw talent. There's a, a million little things that go on. And very rarely do you find somebody who has accomplished as much as you have that also has a level of self-awareness that is able to explain how they got there or at least how they think they got there yeah well okay good i hope I, i'm helpful in that, in that absolutely man thank you yeah. so much for coming in. is there anything i haven't asked you that you're no i'm good I, I i i just knew that hunter told me i had to do this podcast and i'm glad i did he had good things to say about you well, i'm glad so, yeah. i've got him fooled if no one else thanks so much man thank you 